August 8, 1969, unknown intruders broke into the fashionable Los Angeles home of movie director Roman Polanski and his pregnant wife, actress Sharon Tate. There they slaughtered her and four others. One night later, another home was invaded and a middle-aged grocery executive and his wife were killed with equal brutality. In two days, an entire city was seized by fear. But it was months before the crimes were connected. When they were, a small bizarre character named Charles Manson was charged with provoking his apparently fanatic followers to commit the crimes. And a national obsession to understand these people began. Who was Charles Manson? As he recalls it, the pain of Charles Manson's childhood began early. I am a street child. I'm a runaway little girl at 15 years old out of Kentucky named Kathleen Maddox. I didn't have a husband. My husband's name was Scott. And he married somebody else and went down the road and she went to Cincinnati and had a guy named Charlie Manson. Charles Manson was born on November 12, 1934 in Cincinnati, Ohio, in Cincinnati General Hospital. His mother, Kathleen Maddox, was just 16 and unmarried when he was born. His father was a Colonel Scott who'd briefly known Kathleen. She was very, very motherly looking. She was as motherly looking as my mother was. My mother went to prison for five years for strong arm robbery. Her brother had to deal a trick in off the street and put the yoke on him to get some money to eat. When I, when I heard she was a prostitute, it just, I couldn't believe that either. And she went to prison, and I used to visit her in the prison visiting room. His mother's absence and rejection would make a life with her a dream of Charles Manson's throughout his childhood. Manson spent many of his early years in the small town of McMechan, West Virginia, with his deeply religious aunt and uncle, living by all appearances a not unhappy small town life. The house was a big older house, but it was beautiful. He had, he had just about anything he wanted, I would say. The, his, his aunt and uncle and grandmother took him to church. He didn't like going. The only thing he really liked, you know, was the singing. But Charles loved to sing. But some of Manson's outlook on the world came from another uncle, a mountain man. Out of the Kentucky mountains, when uh, my uncle said, we ain't surrendered, we're still rebels. And we'll be rebels until the end of time. Because I ain't accepting no Yankee school. He said, don't go to those schools, boy. So when I was nine years old, I set the school on fire, and I went to reform school. Between 1942 and 1947, Manson spent periods of time with his mother and her assorted lovers around the Midwest. But then, unable to place him in a foster home, she allowed the court to place him in the Gibault School for Boys. After 10 months, he ran away to find her, but she would not take him back. This was a turning point for Charles Manson. The only thing my mother taught me was that everything she said was a lie. And I learned never to believe anyone about anything. He ran away from school again and began a life of petty crimes, including breaking into grocery stores and stealing a bicycle. In 1949, after time in a juvenile center, he was sent to Father Flanagan's famous boys town. According to a 1949 article in the Indianapolis News, a dead-end kid who has lived in an emotional blind alley is happy today. He's going to Boys Town. Manson ran away four days later. Now just 13, he stole cars, broke into stores, and committed his first armed robberies. He was then sent to the Indiana School for Boys, where he claims he was raped and repeatedly beaten. He ran away 18 times. Now, the punishments escalated after he stole cars, committed armed robbery, and held up gas stations. He went from the National Training School for Boys to Natural Bridge Camp, to federal reformatories at Petersburg, Virginia, and Chillicothe, Ohio, where he was paroled in 1954. He was just 19 years old. I've been in jail all my life. 
It was one of the curious facts about Charles Manson. He would often manage to commit small-time crimes that nonetheless violated federal laws and would bring tough penalties. A suspended sentence turned into a 10-year term after he violated probation on a charge of forging a very small treasury check. I was struck by something initially, and that is that he had been sentenced to 10 years uh, for attempting to cash a $43 treasury check, and he did seven and a half years. From 1951 to 1967, Charles Manson's rap sheet shows a range of crimes from mail theft to forgery to running prostitutes. It was at McNeil Island Penitentiary that Manson developed a skill at the guitar and an interest in music that would play an important part in later events. The man who taught him the steel guitar was an aging fellow prisoner, the renowned Depression-era gangster Alvin Creepy Carpus. More important, it was in prison with its rigid codes of behavior and its hierarchy that Manson developed his way of looking at the world. See, I never realized that people outside are much different than the people inside. People inside, if you lie, uh, you get punched. You get misused. You don't lie to the lieutenant. Lieutenant don't lie to you. Uh, there's a certain amount of truth in prison, and being raised in prison, I was raised pretty much in the light of that truth. He did his own time. He pretty much refused to be programmed, to go along with the expectations of the prison staff. He sp apparently spent a lot of time in his cell, uh, playing the guitar, writing music. Uh, he did attend a class, did very well in a power of positive thinking class, which I always thought was a part of his style. He was released from prison in 1967. It's been said that he asked not to be released. He'd now spent more than half of his 32 years inside, and prison was the only real home he'd ever known. What's more, Charles Manson had never known life with a real family. That would make a family of his own very appealing. Prison may have meant a life of little change for Charles Manson, but life outside was changing radically. It was a far different world now from the one he'd known before prison, and was one where his particular skills would serve him well. It was the mid-1960s, and the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco was, for hippies and others escaping the mainstream, the promised land. What we saw at its peak were literally thousands of flower children all over the country, all over the world, attracted to this movement. Like, moths to a flames, you know, summer in San Francisco. There was a philosophy here that was totally revolutionary that they'd not heard before, and this was the epicenter of it. A lot of very young, creative, exploring people came, came there, but then you started to see a shift where uh, more disturbed, sicker, more drug-involved people started to come. The hallucinogenic drugs like LSD were being replaced by stimulant drugs, speed particularly, that led to compulsion and paranoia, and innocence was giving way to violence. You may recall a song, uh, the lyrics of which were, if you come to San Francisco, you better wear a flower in your hair. By 1967, if you came to San Francisco, you needed to wear a 45 in your belt. It had changed that fast. The kids were still coming from all over the United States with the same set of expectations, but the welcoming committee was very, very different. There was a, a brand of street theater that was hard to imagine. If we all coming up to the feet, take the area. All the stores out in this area been taken over by the feet mix, and uh, we see them at all shapes and sizes. I think this one is a girl walking in front of us. She has a hair ribbon, but it's hard to tell. It was a scene where if you grew your hair and talk to talk, you fit in. This was the scene which Charles Manson entered on his release from prison in 1967. When he came out, he initially told me that there was nothing I could do, that if I, uh, uh, that he could go back to prison. He was not afraid of it. Uh, he was not going to do parole if parole was going to be uh, onerous. He was clearly an antisocial personality. Uh, he was superficial, he was glib, and he was very adaptable. And when I got out, all your children would come to me because they never had anybody to tell them the truth. He sized up people, I think, fairly quickly. 
uh, and fairly accurately. I think that's a skill you learn in prisons. He said, so your father just kicked you out of the house. And that started it. Lynette Squeaky Fromm joined up with Manson early on. It was easy to talk to him. And we talked in, on a number of levels. His mind intrigued me. Charlie was what he needed to be at any given time. Pat Krenwinkel was another early member of Manson's growing family. I met Charlie when I was living at the beach with my sister, and she came home and said to go down to a friend's house, which I did, and Charlie was there, and he was playing the guitar. And so I was introduced to him there. And that night, um, we slept together, and I felt really loved by him almost immediately, mostly because I think at that point, I was really desperate for someone to care. When we made love, all I remember is just crying and crying to this man. I mean, it was like, because he said, oh, you're beautiful. I couldn't believe that. I just started crying. Manson's family grew to include men. One of them was the young, all-American Texan, Charles Tex Watson. Charlie used sex for, number one, when people would come and he wanted power over them, men, he would offer them whatever women he had. And he had certain women he always put out front, which he called his front street girls. They were the ones that he thought were the most beautiful, the ones that would be the most enticing. And that's what he would do. I mean, he was an excellent pimp. Charles Manson was not only attracting followers, he was also exercising more control over them. Whatever he believed, I would believe. And, and I would say and I would spout off. I began to get increasingly uncomfortable with the amount of control uh, and the way in which he used them. And you could see his, his sense of power and control growing. But in Northern California, at least, the family was monitored by outsiders. I saw him on a weekly basis. He would bring the girls into the, uh, to the office. It was a big occasion. I would go out to, to a home and, and see them. Uh, there was always that string. There was always some reality. The family left San Francisco in the summer of 1967 and began an odyssey up and down the California coast. Moving from place to place was one way Manson kept his followers entertained enough to stay. They started spending more time in the Los Angeles area. There, Manson hoped to make a name for himself in rock and roll. I think he felt that once he got down there, things were going to be very, very different. He had contacts with the Beach Boys. It was through the women that Manson made his connection with Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys. In Los Angeles, Wilson picked up two of the family women hitchhiking and took them home. Soon, Manson and the rest of the family showed up and moved in with Wilson for several months. Then, through Wilson, Manson did some recording, but nothing came of the sessions. Manson was always bitter that his music would remain unheard. They came to the ranch, lady. I didn't go to them, they came to me. You're stealing my music every day. You're writing my songs, you're playing my game. In August of 1968, longtime family member Susan Atkins found the family a new home, an old Western movie set and now riding stable owned by an 80-year-old half-blind man named George Spahn. Leslie Van Houten joined the family in the summer of 1968. You know, all very fun in the beginning, innocent. At first, the family reveled in the crumbling movie set and the beautiful countryside around it. They play-acted roles they might have taken in old movies. It was like summer camp, and Charles Manson was head counselor. It was a great place, actually. We could make anything we wanted out of it. It was like having the R Gang set, you know? You could turn it into anything. The whole idea was to let time disappear. There was no time. We were all living now. Now was the only time. See, at first, the magical mystery tour was that we would be cowboys or gypsies or pirates. And every, every day it was to wear a different role so that we would get um, more out of ourselves. And our, every day was Halloween. Losing oneself, killing old egos, and replacing them with Manson and his very particular view of the world, it was the serious goal of all that play acting that Manson directed. If you wipe away somebody's identity, say society is corrupt, 
forget about everything you ever learned. But then you substitute your own philosophy. It's like wiping the blackboard clean and then introducing your philosophy, and then you become the absolute leader. Bit by bit, the family became one with Manson. One of his things was to stop you during the day, and he'd put your palms up to his, and then he'd move them in any direction that he could. Or he'd make a series of faces, and then you were supposed to try to keep up with them. And the whole thing was always geared toward um, just complete mirroring of, of him. One powerful way that Manson maintained control was through drugs, in particular, LSD. Well, we took hundreds of trips together. The acid trips were exercises in total control. With Charlie, he actually did almost like drug programming. I mean, he was the focal point at all times. And what seems so amazing is that he somehow, because acid is a very powerful drug, and it's like, I don't, I would feel like totally out of control and yet I would watch him and he would seem totally in control. One of the things when I look back I realize I didn't always see him take acid. I don't think he did. The idea was to get rid of all the conditioning, to die in yourself. So he would hold you up and say something to you. Say, see I can see your mother on you, it's still the conditioning. You know, you haven't gotten rid of it, you're not dead yet. Sometimes he would reenact the crucifixion when we were on LSD. And it was very realistic. I would die for you. And then the questions would begin, um, would you die for me? And what was the philosophy that Manson was offering? It had begun with a notion of oneness and the power of love. But over time, it grew steadily more paranoid. The messages to the family grew steadily darker. There was no right or wrong. And life and death were really the same thing. In fact, death could be a welcome step on the way to a better world. And in the fall and winter of 1968, as Manson saw himself more and more a lone visionary, he and the family spent more and more time in a place that only increased their sense of isolation, a remote outpost in Death Valley, Barker Ranch. We really weren't in touch. We were allowed to listen to the Beatles and the Moody Blues and Manson's music. Nonetheless, Manson was aware of what was going on in the nation's cities. Since 1966, city after city had seen rioting in black neighborhoods. The cry for black power was being heard alongside the ever stronger actions against the war in Vietnam. Because if America don't come round, America should be burnt down. The family moved back to Los Angeles in January of 1969. Then the paranoia increased even more in early July when Manson thought he'd killed a black drug dealer he also thought was a Black Panther. Now convinced that the full fury of the Panthers was soon to descend on the family, bitter about his failure to record his music, and most importantly, certain that a giant race war was impending, Charles Manson spent July and early August tense, paranoid, and angry. On the night of August 9, 1969, at a house on Cielo Drive in Los Angeles, actress Sharon Tate, wife of movie director Roman Polanski and eight months pregnant, was at home with her friends, the hairstylist Jay Sebring, coffee heiress Abigail Folger, and Roman's friend Wojtek Frykowski. A young man named Stephen Parent was also on the site, visiting the home's caretaker. That night's murders began with some preparations at Spawn Ranch. I was with the children. We were in a trailer. I was with someone else, and we were in a trailer. And Charlie came and woke me up. And he said, get up. I want you to go somewhere. He said, get in the car. And I was in the car with Tex and Linda Kasabian and Susan Atkins. And he said, do everything the Tex says. And we were off. Tex Watson went onto the property first. When he came upon Stephen Parent in his car, he shot him four times. We heard gunshots. He came back and told us to come with him. And we followed. 
trying to get into the house, he eventually, I think he like went through a window or something, returned to a front door and allowed the rest of us to enter. There was a man that he was dealing with, and I think that was um, Jay Sebring, I believe. Uh, he had him on the floor or something, and he was going to like tie him up. And he asked Susan to check the back rooms. And what began to happen is a scuffle started taking place between Tex and um, the man and Jay Sebring, and he and he shot him. And everyone else at that point obviously was was getting really frightened and scared. And what eventually took place is that there was an attempt to tie tie everyone up. And when there was a, an attempt to tie everyone up, eventually um, Abigail Folger started to get herself undone, and she took off. I ran after her with an upraised knife, and we went out through a back door out onto the lawn. And I started stabbing her. I, I, I ran her down, and I began to stab her. I remember her saying, I'm already dead. It was Tex Watson who delivered most of the fatal blows at the house that night. We, we, we just, we were so locked in, like, it's just like, okay, okay, this must be, this, and when you just become more in, in more like a robot, like somehow this must bring it. The scene left behind was grotesque. There was blood everywhere. A rope tied twice around Sharon Tate's neck was looped over a beam and tied around Jay Sebring's neck. Abigail Folger and Wojtek Frykowski lay on the front lawn. Stephen Parent lay dead in his car. And on the front door in Sharon Tate's blood was the word pig. Besides being shot and bludgeoned, the victims had been stabbed a total of 102 times. When I got back to the ranch, we got out of the car. Charlie came up and asked everybody how it went. But that was the first time I looked at him and I said, Charlie, they were so young. And he just said, go with Tex. The next night, another attack. This time, it was at the home of grocery company executive Lino LaBianca and his wife Rosemary in a very different section of Los Angeles. Manson knew the house because he'd attended a party at a neighboring home in the past. Along this second night would be Leslie Van Houten, anxious to prove her loyalty to Manson. I knew that people would die. I knew that there would be killing. Manson, Van Houten, Krenwinkel, Watson, Atkins, and Linda Kasabian drove around for a while before they stopped at the LaBianca house. Manson went inside, tied up the LaBiancas, and then left. Pat had a knife. And I tried to hold Mrs. LaBianca down, and I couldn't do it. And Pat went to stab her, and she couldn't do it. Leslie was still trying to hold her because she was struggling. And I went and got Tex. And Tex went into the bedroom. And I stood in the hallway. And I looked into an empty room in the den. And I just stayed there, and I didn't move. And I have no sound memory of um, Mrs. LaBianca dying. I, I, all I remember is staring into that room. And then Tex turned me around and handed me the knife and he said, do something. Because Manson had told him to make sure that all of us got our hands dirty. And, um, I stabbed Mrs. LaBianca in the lower back about 16 times. The scene at the LaBiancas was no less macabre than that at the Tate House. A carving fork protruded from Lino LaBianca's stomach and a knife from his throat. And the word war was carved in his flesh. Mrs. LaBianca was in the bedroom, her head covered by a pillowcase with a lamp cord tied around her neck. On the walls, written in their blood, were the words, death to pigs, and rise. And on the refrigerator door, the words, 
Helter Skelter. I said, if you're going to do something, leave something witchy. Just like I would tell you, if you're going to do something, do it well and leave something witchy. Leave a sign to let the world know that you were there. Have a good day. The two victims had been stabbed a total of 67 times. Meanwhile, the news of the first night's murders had hit L.A. like an earthquake. There was a, a terrible fear, a terrible a trepidation on the part of the Hollywood community that this killing, this ritualistic killing, had something to do with celebrityism. And so a lot of the high-profile Hollywood stars, uh, apparently Sinatra left town, Tony Bennett was living at the Beverly Hills Hotel in one of the bungalows, who he moved inside to be safe. Steve McQueen supposedly drove around with a gun in the front seat of the car now, all because, all reacting to the Sharon Tate killings. It was amazing. Everyone's got a piece of the story. Everyone, everywhere every, you went, there was somebody say, did you know that they found the thing and that, you know. It seemed everyone wanted a gun. 200 guns were sold by one Beverly Hills store in two days. It took two weeks to get a locksmith. Police were interviewing many celebrities, and some became more careful about their habits. One local in the film business said, toilets are flushing all over Beverly Hills. The entire Los Angeles sewer system is stoned. Now the rumors start to fly. The first rumor that hit, as far as the crimes were concerned, was that it was drug-related. It was a drug hit. And on top of that, it was Roman Polanski's wife. People knew about Polanski's film, Knife in the Water, all of these strange, dark, mystical movies involving uh, drugs and sex and killings. Sharon not only didn't use drugs. In the beginning, you know, there were those who thought Roman had an involvement in this. It was conjecture Polanski quickly denied. It's terrible for him when he came back for the funeral. And Warren Beatty was telling me this. I mean, people thought he somehow had something to do, which, of course, he didn't. In spite of the obvious similarities between the Tate and LaBianca murders, the police believed that the second crime was merely a copycat incident based on news reports of the first. And the two investigations were run quite separately. During the investigation, the family was actually arrested and then released on an unrelated charge of auto theft. They then headed to the safety of Barker Ranch in Death Valley. On October 10th, the family was rounded up on new charges of auto theft and arson. And while they were in jail, the L.A. murder cases broke open. Family member Susan Atkins was implicated by another member in an earlier crime. Jailed in L.A., she blabbed to cellmates about the Tate and LaBianca murders. The more you kill, the better you like it, she told them. Then one cellmate repeated the stories to the police. In December of 1969, nearly four months after the crimes, Charles Manson and five family members were charged with the Tate and LaBianca murders. What some called the crime of the century would now move on to a trial that would mesmerize a city. The trial of Charles Manson, Pat Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, and Susan Atkins for the Tate and LaBianca murders began on June 15, 1970. Manson demanded and was refused permission to serve as his own attorney. Still, from the beginning, it was clear that Manson was in complete control of the defense. You have to realize that uh, I viewed Manson as being the main defendant. Uh, to convict his co-defendants and have him walk out of court, I think, would have been an unsuccessful prosecution. Uh, the problem was that Manson was not at the murder scene. He did not physically participate in these murders. So I had to bring him in by way of circumstantial evidence uh, and also by the law of conspiracy. At the heart of the prosecution effort was the bizarre story of Helter Skelter, the stranger-than-fiction doomsday scenario that Charles Manson had woven from his earlier certainty of a coming race war. Helter Skelter was a name he'd taken from a Beatles song. Manson envisioned that white people would turn against the black man if they thought the black man had committed these seven murders, and ultimately there would be a civil war between blacks and whites out on the street. During the war, he told them, he said, we're going to hide out, we're, we're going to hide out in the bottomless pit 
in the desert, a place that derived from Revelation 9, a, a chapter in the last book of the New Testament. Manson foresaw that the black man would win this war. But later on, he said the black man, because of inexperience, would simply not be able to handle the reins of power. So we would have to look around at those white people who had survived, who had escaped from Helter Skelter. And he said, we'll come out of the bottomless pit. And quoting Manson, we'll send Blackie on his way to pick and cotton, and we'll take over the leadership of the world. The chief prosecution witness was Linda Kasabian, who had driven the car on the night of the Tate murders. She agreed to testify in return for immunity. Can you get out of the way? The mood around the trial and throughout L.A. was as bizarre as the accused themselves. It may be more than six months before the Tate case finally goes to trial here at the Hall of Justice, but Hollywood isn't waiting. Two movies about the mass murders already are in the works. One producer said his film will concentrate on the hippie clan charged with murder and explain on the screen why they might have done it. Day after day, Manson would come into court and by turns intimidate and amuse. He was playing the, the people. He was playing to the courtroom. He was playing to the, to the press. We had quite a few staring sessions. He was all staring at people, you know, he'd stare at, at the jury and they would turn away. He'd turn around and stare at spectators. During the trial, as in their lives before, the three women took all their instructions from Manson. The entire proceedings were scripted by Charlie. Every day we'd meet and he'd decide, well, today I want you each to stand up and hold your hands in some stupid symbols. You're gonna get up and scream. You know, each day was scripted. And that day we proceeded through the events. With Manson, he believed that everything we did was creating some picture that was going to go out in the universe and somehow change it towards his, bend it towards his will. The daily march of Van Houten, Atkins, and Krenwinkel, smiling and singing, was unnerving to anyone who saw it on the news. The song they were singing was one that Manson had written. After disrupting the proceedings a number of times, the rest of the family was banned from the courtroom, so they moved to the hallways and kept a vigil outside. At first, the mood was almost festive. We saw them every day, you know. Come on, Squeaky, uh, you can't really be serious about that, you know. And we would banter back and forth, and so there was a joviality. But continuing to shock the courtroom, Manson carved an X into his forehead in late July to symbolize his removal from society. The following weekend, the three girls followed suit. National attention on the trial included unwelcome notice from the highest level. President Nixon spoke of Charles Manson in a speech on August 3rd. Here is a man who was guilty, uh, directly or indirectly, of eight murders without reason. Uh, here is a man yet who, as far as the coverage was concerned, uh, appeared to be rather a glamorous figure. And the next day, a smiling Charles Manson held the headline up to the jury as the defense demanded a mistrial. It was denied in spite of the defense team's best efforts. The President of the United States says somebody's guilty. What recourse do you have? You answer the question. Inside the courtroom, the most dramatic moment occurred on October 5, 1970, when Manson lunged 10 feet towards the judge. He was restrained, and the trial continued. Uh, it certainly was within earshot. On November 16th, the prosecution rested, and the defense rested without calling a single witness. Struggles with Manson and changes in the defense team were constant, but there was still alarm when defense lawyer Ronald Hughes did not show up in court. His body was later discovered in a wilderness area. One ex-family member has since claimed he was murdered for disagreeing with Manson over Leslie Van Houten's defense. On January 25, 1971, after nine days of deliberation, the jury found each defendant guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and murder in the first degree. In a separate trial, Tex Watson was also found guilty and sentenced to death. In the penalty phase of the trial, the women did testify and tried to exonerate Manson. And now the instructions from Manson were changing. One of the things that Charlie always promoted about himself was, I don't lie. And all of a sudden, he was asking every one of us to lie on a daily basis about something. Oh, say this, say that. And we're going, but I didn't do that. 
And it was like, you lie, a god lies. <laughs> On March 9th, the jury called for the death penalty for all four defendants, a finding the judge then upheld. In protest, the women shaved their heads. Before that clerk reads that verdict, you don't know what he's gonna say, life or death. It's a very tense, suspenseful moment. And uh, I looked over at Manson and his hands were uh, trembling. Now here's, a, here's someone who always spoke about the beauty of death. He was always telling everyone, death is a beautiful thing and maybe when we kill these people, we're doing them a favor and they don't even realize it. But I was with him for nine and a half months and he fought very hard for his own life, see? So that was just pure hypocrisy on his part. The defendants faced the death penalty now. To at least one of them, it was a kind of relief. I was more than willing to go to the gas chamber. I didn't fear it. The death penalty for me at the time seemed, it almost justified my not having to deal with what I had done. It was the eye for an eye. They're gonna kill me, I don't have to deal with it. And then in 1972, the Supreme Court overturned the death penalty. Death sentences were commuted to terms of life imprisonment. In the case of Charles Manson, there was a certain irony involved. In fact, he told me after, after the trial, Bugliosi says, you know, you haven't achieved anything here. He said, all you've done is send me back to where I came from. But I said, well, yeah, Charlie, that's true. But as far as I know, you've never been in the green room before. The, the green room is, is, is a reference to San Quentin uh, um, gas chamber. The next year, I was driving my car, and the car radio was on. And I heard where the, where the U.S. Supreme Court had set aside the death penalty, Furman versus Georgia. And the very first thought that came to my mind is that what Manson had told me at the end of the trial was true, that all we did is send him back to where he came from, and he doesn't mind prison life. So in a sense, and I hate to say this, in a sense, Manson has beaten the rap. It was 1972, and Pat Krenwinkel and Leslie Van Houten were still young women with a lifetime ahead of them, a lifetime to face what they had done. More than 30 years after the murders at the Tate and LaBianca homes, Charles Manson, Patricia Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, Susan Atkins, and Tex Watson are all still in prison serving life terms. All have been reviewed for parole numerous times, but it's always been denied. You can have the rest of it and put me back in my cell. This is all I really want. want Charles Manson has not even attended all of his hearings. I think there's a decision among you, is there? Now Charles Manson is moving into his 70s, and Tex Watson and the women are in their 50s. To listen to Manson, Pat Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten today is to hear very different memories of those events well over a quarter century ago. If anything, the, old, the older I get, the harder it is. Mrs. LaBianca was younger than I am now. I took away all that life. I see blood in here every day. Every day someone's getting shot, someone's getting cut, someone's getting beat. I've lived in that all my life, woman. That don't wrinkle up my forehead. You can pile out the hundred dead bodies up in front of my cell and it don't set me to do nothing. Every day I wake up and know that I'm a destroyer of the most precious thing, which is life. And living with that is the most difficult thing of all. And I do that because that's what I deserve, is to wake up every morning and know that. You know, it didn't happen overnight. He spent a lot of time taking middle-class girls and remolding them. I never broke nobody's will. I never told anybody to do anything other than what they wanted to do. Oh, Charlie's just absolutely lying. There wasn't one thing done that was even allowed to be done without his expressed permission. Wait a minute. I said, you do what's best for you. You do what you feel is right. You do what you think is right. Now, whatever you think is right, it's got to be right. All I'm doing is I'm walking with, the, I'm walking with you, I'm walking in line with you, and I'm holding the line with you. What you do is up to you. It's got nothing to do with me. You know, I, I take offense to the fact that 25 years later, Manson doesn't own up to his share in this. I take offense to that. I take, um, 
responsibility for my part. And part of my responsibility was helping create him. Every once in a while I get letters from children. And um, they seem to think that what we did is all right. There is nothing, nothing that we did that is all right. Nothing. He was not Jesus Christ or Satan. He was a very odd, bizarre, high-energy, little antisocial who had some poor, confused, middle-class dropouts who decided to follow him. And he got into a situation where he had enormous power over these people, and he pulled it all together into this incoherent, hateful kind of plan and there was no one there to say, Charlie, girls, this is crazy.